Friedrich Luft, one of the most prominent critics um, in post-war Germany, and an intellectual with close connections to Hollywood, was shocked when he saw the documentary film Auschwitz in September 1945 in Berlin. Like other so-called atrocity films produced by the Allied countries, the film showed real images of the concentration camp, the crematoriums, its prisoners, and even corpses. Between the end of the war and mid-1946, the Allies screened these films for Germans in order to confront them with images of horror from camps like Auschwitz, Buchenwald, and Bergen-Belsen. Contemporary research conducted on the viewer's audience uh, experienced by social researchers reflected well the Allies' motivation for showing these films. They believe that the sheer undeniability of real images would generate feelings like guilt, and shame among the German viewers. In particular, they thought evoking feelings of shame was a necessary first step towards the re-education of Germans. In that sense, the re-education program was also a reform of German sensibilities, a fact that can be gleaned from Friedrich Luft's descriptions of his reception of the film he saw. Quote, each one of these kinematic images of the most shameful sensation chokes the conscience. Four million people incinerated, gassed, starved, poisoned, shot, because they did not have the questionable advantage of being seen as a member of the master race. The shame caused by these intense images of the most depraved cruelty knocks the wind out of the viewer and he needs hours to recover from the heaviness of these extremely direct impressions. Without wanting to cast doubt on Luft's feeling, his statement is nevertheless stricken with a certain cynicism. After all, during the Nazi era, Luft himself had penned screenplays that conformed to Nazi ideology. Alongside scripts for, a new education, for new educational films commissioned by the army, he wrote the, the text for the so-called cultural film Ein Wort von Mann zu Mann, Man to Man Talk, which was screened for soldiers on the front to warn them on the dangers of venereal disease. Of course, having written screenplays for films during National Socialism is not per se a crime especially, one might argue, if they merely sought to hinder the spread of venereal disease. Such medical-oriented films had been produced during the First World War and throughout the Weimar Republic, and some of them even attained blockbuster status, such as Es werde Licht from 1916 or Falsche Scham, False Shame from 1925. Similar films were also being shot by state institutions in the United States and France during the First and Second World War. And some were produced by well-known directors as a, film, as a Hollywood figure, John Ford. Ford directed the, fi um, the film called um, Sex Hygiene in 1942. However, as I would like to show in my talk, these films are not just medical issues or cultural products. They can also constitute as highly political forces. And that holds all the more in totalitarian systems. Cinema, I argue, can be an important site of political action, as film shape not only our understandings, but also our behavior and emotional life. In order to establish a wider context, I will begin by discussing the political significance, significance attributed to film by National Socialist leaders who believed that film had an important role to play in shaping the cultured man of the new regime. I would then like to discuss the ways in which the fight against venereal disease was, was bound up with sexual politics, which has utmost importance for the Nazi regime. After this, I will discuss a group of soldiers and Nazi front cinema, which is to say, film produced with explicit purpose of screening them to soldiers fighting on the front. A detailed analysis of the film Ein Wort von Mann zu Mann, Man to Man Talk, demonstrate 
that while the film's emotional language ultimately sought to build trust between doctor and soldier, this trust was bound with violence. In more general terms, I use this analysis to test the claim that totalitarian regimes, which might also be called regimes of fear, not only take serious the use of emotions to direct the masses, but also consciously deploy positive emotions to stabilize the political order. In March 1933, that is shortly after seizing power, Propaganda Minister Josef Goebbels held a speech in which he stated that the Nazi government would actively promote the productions of film. He believed that the spiritual film crisis of the Weimar Republic had to be confronted head on. Interestingly, Goebbels was against the production of transparently ideological propaganda films. Instead, the self-described lover of cinematic art viewed film as an expression of the, of the cultural will of the nation, as an important psychological means for bolstering the German people's spirituality life, vitality. For him, film's special use of sight and sound addresses a specific experience level. This film's potential to create audiovisual excitement enables it to reach a wider audience than any other media. Thus, right from the start, um, Goebbels thought that Nazi political ideas should be translated into media and aesthetics forms. Goebbels' notions of this cinema of affective overwhelming was not entirely original, but drew on Weimar debates on the potential of cinema too as the important Weimar director Felix Lampe put it, quote, to expand knowledge, deepen emotional life, steer the imagination and influence the will. In this sense, I would like to set aside for a moment the dominant view in history that the Nazis instrumentalized the medium of film for ideological purpose and instead explore the question what happens to Nazi ideology itself when it meets with this affecting-laden, emotionally coded cinema of affective overwhelming, the question of, of a medialization of the ideological. Like the United States, France and Britain, technological change was transforming Germany into a modern media society, and the rapid social changes of the Weimar Republic played its part too. Thus, it's no surprise that film would also come to constitute an important piece of social, cultural, and political life under National Socialism. An index of this can be found in the sheer increase of cinemas during the Nazi era. In 1933, there were about 5,000 movie houses. By 1942, there were already about 9,000 theaters in Germany, including the um, cinemas of the occupied territories. Like during the Weimar area, most theaters were in the cities, while rural areas were served by mobile sound projectors organized by Nazi Gau leadership. Um, this is a mobile uh, setting which was used to bring films to the rural people. That's actually from the 1950s, as I do not have a picture um, of uh, um, the Nazi car, so to say. Uh, but it might look, just to give you an idea, it might look similar. While the careers of some important UFA producers like Kurtomala and Nikolaus Kaufmann benefited from the Nazi takeover, those of many others were immediately endangered by it. Even before 1933, the Nazis had decried jury in film as being as bearing responsibility for the fall of the nation and subsequently threatened to destroy it. Already in 1931, Hitler's journal National Socialist Monthly stated that film stood under the domination of international jury. It called for the cleansing of racial foreign elements from the entire, entirety of film. Goebbels' decree of July 1943 made then the aim of Aryanization film explicit. From then on, a film could only be counted as a German film if all those who had worked on it could prove that they were German heritage and held German citizenship. This was a systematic attempt to exclude Jewish persons from the studios. According to that law, even a single non-Aryan person was, was part of the production team of the film. It had to be labeled as a foreign film and was excluded. 
The political shift also had concrete consequences in institutional respect. The three institutions as the Reichspropaganda Abteilung of the NSDAP, the Reichsministerium für Volksaufklärung and Propaganda, and the Reichskulturkammer quickly established control over the media. The centralization of cultural policy in the hands of party and state was rounded off by the instrument of an overarching censorship. By April 1933, films produced during the Weimar Republic were being retroactively censored, and 33 films of purely communist, Marxist, and pacifist content were banned. Among them were the proletarian film Hule Wampe. I could not translate that expression. Sorry for that. Maybe we can talk about that later. Um, the anti-war film Im Westen Nichts Neues. But so were films that addressed health prevention, like Frau Not, Frau Glück, edited by the Russian avant-garde director Sergei Eisenstein, and films like the venereal disease film Die Geschlechtskrankheiten, all were banned for their sexual tendencies. Films produced after the Nazi takeover were subjected to double censorship. The first round took place during the actual process of production. Scripts were checked by Nazi dramaturgs, and only films which approved scripts received financing from the film credit bank. Completed films then had to undergo a second round of censorship, which was prescribed in an explicit law. Although Nazi film censorship was further reaching than that of the Weimar area, it generally took place without any public discussion. Thus, we can see that the implosion of democracy had serious implication for all spheres of life, including film, from the very start. A closer look at the Nazi censorship guidelines surprisingly re reveals the plethora of rules for emotions. For instance, a film could be banned if it endangered vital interests of the states, that's similar to the Weimar um, censorship laws, did injury to national socialist moral and cultural feelings, and in addition, the guideline explains that the film was to be labeled as injurious and brutalize, brutalizing if showing it would wake um, some slumbering raw instincts and dull the emotional life of the viewer. A film was seen as depraved if it threatened to injure moral thinking and feeling. The frequent use of the word feeling is remarkable and so too are the definitions given to it. The censors were careful to note that it shouldn't be confused with sensitivity, because the measure are the normal feelings of the average man. An investigation cannot take into account abnormal or sick people. The concept of the average man was developed by the Belgian statistician Adolf Quetelet in the mid-19th century. The concept denoted the middle of society and was constructed out of mean values. By the beginning of the 20th century, the parameter had become a standard tool in sociology, pedagogy, and psychology. The Nazi censorship guidelines, however, transformed the average mean from an aggregation of statistical values into a creator of ideology by equating it with the German man of culture. This definition equates feeling with the normality of the average man as such, while its opposite, sensitivity, is defined as the feelings of the lone, sick individual standing outside the norm. But what significance does this repeated references to and definitions of various emotions concepts have? Are they simply placeholders for political loaded ideas? Such an interpretation is possible, but it fails to explain the quantitative and qualitative wealth of expression. It seems more helpful to look at the common measure against which all of these terms are defined, the German man of culture. This German man of culture had, by definition, a religious, moral, and artistic sensibility because he had national honor universal morality, self-respect, and cultivated instincts. 
By taking the German win of culture as its common measure, the new political system did not only support the production of a cinema of affective overwhelming, the system also used censorship to ensure that films were addressing the public in a way that was conducive for the construction of a new man with its own complex emotional repertoire. By conceiving of and regulating film as a tool for the creation and education of the man of culture, the Nazis well understood film's potential as a visual influential force. In making film into their own medium of choice, the Nazis drew on psychological research on the effects of film. A key work in this field was Wolfgang Wilhelm's dissertation, Die Auftriebswirkung des Films, which was published in 1940, that is, after the outbreak of the war. The dissertation was widely commented on in the press and was perhaps more important, importantly touted as a sort of standard work for filmmakers. Wilhelm believed that while Weimar films had served as a distraction from everyday life, film under National Socialism was founded a serious relationship between viewer and production, which made it spiritually enriching. For him, film could serve as a mirror and support for men. In that sense, the text underscored the enormous significance of emotions for films. Its stated aim was to analyze film's effect on the feeling of spiritual motivation of the new man. Willem saw film's motivating um, effect in the fact that it made possible an experience of immediacy and a feeling of omnipresence. And he saw that the later, in particular, caused a satisfied feeling of omnipotence. Moreover, Willem claimed that film enriching and expanding feelings of vitality and that techniques like close-ups could express feelings of time in compressed form which allowed viewers to escape everyday situations <coughs> and satisfy the impulses for experience. All of this, Willem concluded, would smack the viewer with the rhythm of world events. Before I will discuss how this comprehensive conception of film as a medium of emotions took on con concrete form as in films like the prevention film on venereal disease, Ein Wort von Mann zu Mann, let me briefly introduce you to National Socialist's fight against venereal disease and the militarization of male sexuality. As early as Mein Kampf, published in 1925, Adolf Hitler had equated the fight against venereal disease with the fight against prostitution and believed that the civilization of the body of the people was a national task of utmost importance. He wrote, quote, The fight against syphilis and its pacemaker, prostitution, is one of the most colossal tasks of mankind, colossal for the reason that it does not involve the solution of a single question in itself, but rather the abolition of quite a series of evils which, as their consecutive symptoms, give the cause for this disease. For the illness of the body is here only the result of an illness of moral, social and racial instincts." End of quote. In line with this, the Nazi government took up the fight against public immorality right after seizing power. A decree regulated the issue as did revisions to the law on combating venereal disease and the penal code. Churches in particular greeted efforts to shut down brothels and meeting places for homosexuals and to ban pornography from newsstands. All of this illustrates well the Nazi's regime endeavor to fuse sexuality, marriage, and reproduction. A pillar of the policy of racial homogeneity was the notion that marriage and family life be founded in organic principles. This was set forth from July 1933 on in different laws with criminalized, criminalized sexual relations between Jews and non-Jews. This law, which provided the legal foundation for the imprisonment, sterilization and murder of countless people, received argumentative support from a number of films. Among them were silent movies such as Sünden der Väter, Abseits vom Wege und Erbkrank. The first three. 
These films explain the so-called race questions, calculated the high cost of caring for mentally disabled people with little social use and pleaded for their sterilization. The future films Das Erbe und Opfer der Vergangenheit, these two, use similar arguments and sometimes even the same images at the, as the first three ones. And they were classified as political valuable. All of these films used analogies with plants and animals to celebrate the struggle for existence, the security of the species through breeding, and the new laws as human means for ridding humanity of the sins of the past. Finally, the film Eine Vierenhalbjährige Mitzu Fekalin, the very last one, also released, um, released in 1937, sorry, explicitly made the case for Eutanasia. These Eugenitus films were supplemented by the exhibition Das Wunder des Lebens, held in Berlin, held in Berlin. The exhibition championed Nazi race theories and thematized sexuality. Notably, it explicitly condoned extramarital sex so long as it lead to the birth of a child um, of good racial and genetic health. In doing so, the large public exhibition ultimately prioritized genetic purity over sexuality. So, while premarital and extramarital sex was accepted by the Nazi regime, it took measures in the fight against venereal disease in preparation for the 1936 Olympics, measures that went beyond the already existing laws and their routine enforcement. The police undertook campaigns to get prostitutes with venereal disease off the streets. But while street prostitution was hit with heavy penalties, Brussels underwent a renaissance. Indeed, in February 1936, the highest rank officers of the Wehrmacht stated that setting up military brothels was a matter of utmost urgency. In doing so, they draw on a study by the military doctor Julius Kamaya, who concluded that the potential diminishing of troops' fighting power could be countered through the construction of brothels. Despite reservations and the fact that Nazi policy labeled prostitutes as are social and racial inferior, military leaders and the Minister of the Interior stood by their position that Brussels could serve a hygienic and military function. After the start of the Second World War, the position was reinforced. On se September 1939, just days after the invasion of Poland, the Minister of the Interior, Wilhelm Frick, issued a a secret decree dictating the establishment of military brothels so that German soldiers would have access to registered prostitutes in controlled facilities. The consensus was that soldiers could only be effective fighters if they were sexually satisfied. Moreover, the idea was shared that regularly heterosexual sex would have a positive effect on their morale and work. Heinrich Himmer, leader of the SS and German police, shared this view. In an order issued in October 1939, he stated that if soldiers were ready to die unconditionally, they should also have the freedom to love unconditionally. He too took course to the idea that sexual relations with prostitutes could make soldiers more courageous on the battlefield. Himmler in particular subscribed to the view that those soldiers whose strong sexual energy made them predisposed to using prostitutes would later end up being good citizens. The military translated this view into practice by giving soldiers 12 condoms a month. Thus, the sexual abstinence of soldiers promoting during the First World War was not only over, but the soldier's ability to fight was associated with fertility and reproduction. It should be clear that the main point of all these efforts was not to satisfy the sexual needs of individual soldiers, but to, but to support the military strengths. With this context in mind, it should not come as a surprise that combating venereal disease attracted renewed attention after the beginning of the war. In this context, film played a major role, and in 1941, the aforementioned film Ein Wort von Mann zu Mann was released. 
Its target audience was soldiers and it was green on the front. German soldiers' free time activities on the front were not limited to visit to the Brussels. The Wehrmacht also organized various cultural events, among them visits to the theater. So-called front vacationers got discount tickets to the theater and opera, and special shows were put on just for soldiers. Moreover, the Nazi program of culture and mentoring found its way to the front. For instance, in July 1942, the Prussian State Theater of Berlin went on tour on the front. Made possible by a mobile sound pro film projector, the Wehrmacht also screened feature films, cultural films, and the weekly news on the front. The official statement was that, quote, you soldiers should know that we are all that we are all are always there for you. The front is everywhere where German soldiers are and where German workers work. That's why we can say German films everywhere are being deployed on the front. End of quote. The screen films spanned a variety of genres from comedies to war films. A lot of reports show that soldiers had a particular fondness for fairy tale films. And what for Mansumang was among the many cultural educational films that were supposed to inform soldiers about pertinent issues. Directed by the Austrian Alfred Ströger, the film received a prize and was praised by Josef Goebbels at the first Reich Week for German f Cultural Film in Munich. The film Censure's Office classified the film as political valuable, artistical valuable and educational for the nation. The screenplay was one of a few written by Friedrich Luft for the Army's film Bureau. According to dramaturg and critic Luft, the film the stated aim was to distinguish his work from Weimar films he castigated as degenerated moral police. The Weimar films he was talking about, an example here is um, Find in Blut, often used shocking real-life images of a merely disease in the context of fictional plots. The idea was that by provoking fear, disgust and shame in the viewers, the films might keep them from engaging in risky activities. Luft, in contrast, thought that the vagaring finger of the teacher or moral judge should be avoided at all costs, as should lengthy medical explanations. The film Ein Wort von Mann zu Mann seeks to do justice to Luft's idea by using a sleek plot built on a love triangle and a conventional exposition climbing denouement structure. The main characters are Günther Eschenloher and Ernst Velo, two soldiers in the barracks and Irmgard Eschenloher's fiancé. So you see there are two men and one woman and we have a problem here. After an evening of dance and drink, Irmgard starts an affair with a promiscuous velo, gets gonorrhea, and then transmits it to her husband-to-be. After realizing that he is infected, the serious and cultivated Ashenloher, who has remained true to his girl, falls into a crisis because he can't understand how he got infected. A clever trick played on him by an older soldier and the physician finally makes him overcome his shame, acknowledge that he got it from Irmgard and get treatment. Going to the doctor ensures that Eschenloher and Irmgard, ensures Eschenloher and Irmgard that they will be cured and can marry in the nearby future. A turn that takes a cue from the classic tale of conversion narratives. Ernst Velo's character, action and fate, are the opposite of Eschenloher's. His weakness of character leads him to get infected again, and even though he is aware of the danger, he transmits the disease to Irmgard, which gets him punished by the military. Moreover, he now has to face infertility. Luft categorized the film as a cultural and educational film, and so did the censors. In line with this, the primary task of Ein Wort von Mann zu Mann was to cultivate and teach, and this task included transmitting medical knowledge. In the film, the doctor treating Ashenloher gives the main character medical advice in his examin examination room. So you see them, it's obvious who it is. 
In doing so, he draws on scientific images, a technique which all of these educational films from early on shared. Thus, the doctor uses animated diagrams, moulins, and drawings to show how venereal disease destroys the body. <coughs> Remarkable is the way in which the medical description are connected with the film's main character, especially the mal um, pelvic organs, when the, when the mal pelvic organs are discussed. As the bacteria indicated by an arrow, you see it here, penetrated the utra, the voice of the doctor chimes in from off screen. What happened, Eschenlohr? Let's talk openly about it. You got yourself infected. At this stage, I can easily help you." End of quote. While the doctor explains how bacteria spread throughout the body, the viewer is shown an animation of the circulatory system. So that's here, um, it's all of these um, points here are animated then in the film. Um, thus, the doctor explains a medical problem using the example of the main character's body, Ashen Lohr, with whom viewers are supposed to identify. Luft had explicitly stated that he didn't want to want the film to go into the depths of this topic at unnecessary lengths. Real depictions of facial abscesses, commented with words like horrible, terrible, limitless misery, only make a short, shocking moment of the overall lesson. Yet the doctor concludes that the only thing that can protect soldiers from infection is not condoms, but trust. Trust between doctors and soldiers. Trust, quote, from man to man. This is why Luft said that in contrast to a similar Weimar film and Wort from Man zu Man did not aim to speak to the intellect. Instead, the film was supposed to personally speak with each individual viewer in a manly, trustful, responsible, authoritative way, man-to-man -man talk." End of quote. <clears throat> the title itself clearly states that the com communicative strategies that Luft used in his attempt to forge intimacy between men with the military. Thus, the film depicts the military as an institution in which men enjoy camaraderie and speak openly um, about the consequences of libertine sexuality and by implication about sexuality itself. The film does not make a plea for abstinence, nor does it demand the kind of fidelity exemplified by Eschenlohr, and so did all of the films in, in Weimar do. Instead, it explicitly affirms promiscuity by stating that the soldiers are no longer adolescent, by treating all women as possible sources of infection, and by telling soldiers to visit the doctor before and after sexual encounters. The film plots in part the message and that culpability and suffering only come when one neglects, neglects to visit the doctor. And so, Eschenlohr, including his refined emotional repertoire, does not only personify the qualities of the German man of culture articulated in the 1933 uh, in the censorship laws, but shows also how to successfully work through one's emotions. While Eschenlohr is carefully relieved of his false shame within his social group of soldiers, the carelessness and ignorance of Velo is punished through his exclusion from it. Again, promiscuity is not the key issue here. Rather, the only thing that cannot be tolerated is keeping things private. Luft underscored this approach when he stated that notions like guilt were radically stricken from the film's vocabulary. He stated that the film um, clearly highlighted culpability in a case where one neglects, out of cowardice, ignorance, or shame to seek professional help for an illness that is not only a danger to the individual, but to the entire community, thus falling to dispel the danger of his own future and that of his fellow man. This is why the doctor repeatedly references the disease affection on the group. This idea was not new. In the Weimar Republic, individual health was understood and depicted as an element of collective health. During National Socialism, this, no, this notion found its extreme expression in Eugenitz's film, like the already mentioned film Erbkrank or Sünden in der Väter. In this film, the individual overcoming false shame was requisite for the good of the community. 
As Willem had described in his psychological dissertation, the point of using real images of diseased body parts was to illust illustrate the urgency of the illness. For their part, these real images were often close up, a technique Willem sought allowed filmmakers to focus on what was essential and compress the feeling of time. Such depictions of patients were used in these Eugenesis films. Especially these films um, were praised by Josef Goebbels for the blood chilling shot of real images. Yet, while images of the mentally disabled in, in Eugenesis film were supposed to legitimize the Eugenist laws, the real images in Ein Wort von Mann zu Mann were supposed to valorize the doctor. In this film, timely medical assistance relieves the main character of having to suffer the real terrible horror suffering of syphilis. So the comparatively harmless gonorrhea seems to have been sufficient to converse him. Moreover, the film favors emotion like trust, courage, and hope. Together with celebrated feelings of military camaraderie, these positive emotions made possible not only a serious relationship between soldier and doctor within the film, but also one between film and viewer on the, on the extra diegetic level. Again, the psychologist Willman had written about this too. He thought that such a dynamic was necessary for a film to be spiritually enriching and motivating. The extra Exaggerated valorization of the relation between doctor and soldier is a case in point. While films from the Weimar area depicted the patient-doctor relationship through communication of factual knowledge and deployed emotions like fear, disgust and shame to motivate viewers to adopt desirable behaviors, the Nazi area films does away with all taboos penetrating into the main character's intimate life in order to elicit feelings of trust. Although Eschenlauer cannot keep his comrades from learning about his illness, his ability to trust the lead, lead soldier allows him to be overwhelmed, similar to how Goebbels wanted the cinema of effective overwhelming to work on audiences. But Eschenlauer's needs and desires are only the manifest content of the film. The repeated reference to the significance of trust and camaraderie among soldiers make clear that the point is not individual, but the national interest in winning the war. In short, trust in the doctor enables the con conservation of military strengths. As Thomas Kühne has shown, camaraderie was used to establish inner cohesion and the readiness to fight. Camaraderie, and in particular camaraderie on the front, were defined as the epitome of masculinity. They were supposed to make military life easier and at the same time serve to increase soldiers' fitness on the battlefield. The saturated trust between Ashenlow and the doctor addresses the relationship between patient and doctor in general. But beyond that, it also addresses the relationship between Germans and their leader. After all, Adolf Hitler, in his self-conception as a charismatic leader, touted trust in the Führer as a pillar of his leadership. By transmitting its educational message through the fate of Eschenlohr, and what from man to man enables viewers to feel like the main character, just as Willem had theorized. In turn, the film achieves its motivating effect by showing how Eschenlohr profits through <coughs> trust between men and men. Let me conclude. The way in which the film translates the medialization of ideology into a medialization of positive emotions makes it a strong example for the Nazis' communication strategies. While many studies on National Socialism have focused on the instrumentalization of negative emotions like shame, fear and hate, I sought to show how the Nazis' use of positive emotions like trust was central for establishing and stabilizing their totalitarian rule. Finally, the contrast between the vehement something on positive feelings and social reality is remarkable. While the Nazis used positive emotions in their films on sex education, their eugenicist policies and practices deployed sterilization and euthanasia. The National Socialist regime, which 
on, on the whole was a regime of fear, shows that totalitarian systems often use positive emotions to enforce the ideology on their populations. In turn, it illustrates that the use of positive emotion in media can also have a violent dimension. While the historian Jörg Babarowski has rightfully argued that violence is also a reality of emotions, I have argued in this talk that also emotions as trust can be a real reality of violence. A film planned by Friedrich Luft in 1942 with the working title Die Gefahr, The Danger, built as a film on venereal disease for women, was never realized and the exposé seemed to have been lost. The fact that the plan never saw the light of day might have something to do with the fact that before the end of the war, Heimlich Himmler called for Brussels to set up in concentration camps. By that point, the prevention of venereal disease, like the preservation of life, had lost its relevance. While Friedrich Luft does not remember his contribution to the system in September 1945, when he saw an atrocity film, is a question only he could have answered. Thank you.